During the Thanksgiving holiday week this year, I had the opportunity to go on a trip to New Mexico for my first ever elk hunt. So in this video, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the hunt. I'll tell you whether or not I got an elk and I'll tell you 10 lessons I learned during the trip. That's what's coming up next here on Survival on Purpose. Welcome back to Survival on Purpose, your home for trustworthy information and gear reviews related to camping, survival, and general preparedness for regular folks. My name's Brian, thanks for joining me. And like I said, I had the opportunity to go on my very first elk hunt the week of Thanksgiving this year. Uh, we took a trip to Northern New Mexico. I'm gonna tell you all about that, tell you whether or not I got a big old elk, and tell you 10 lessons that I learned on the elk hunting trip. But first, speaking of hunting, that's called a sponsorship segue if you've been watching the channel. Uh, this video is sponsored by my friends at Arms List. Arms List is a website that allows you to connect with other individuals in your area for face-to-face -face gun deals, or you can shop their network of over 1,300 national dealers. So whether you're looking for a really unusual gun or a normal gun, or you got a gun you wanna sell, they're a great way to make that happen. And there's no sales fees, no BS or other nonsense. You just pay a $6.99 a month membership fee, and that allows you to access the website and connect with other people. They also do a really great job of fighting legal battles to protect yours and my right to buy and sell firearms, which I think is pretty cool. So, so I encourage you to check out the folks at Arms List. Now, YouTube won't let me put a link to them in the description, so there'll be a link to my website where there'll be a page that'll be a link to, to them. So that's what you got to do these days. But anyway, uh, thanks again to the folks at Arms List for sponsoring this video. Now, let's talk about the trip. And I've got myself a list here so I don't forget. So um, first of all, i give you a quick background on the trip. Um, I got very fortunate because uh, one of my business partners, a friend of his, he um, had paid for this trip to New Mexico and he couldn't go. So he asked my friend if he'd go ahead and do it since he'd already paid for it. So he said yes and he invited me. What a great friend. So, and the way it works in New Mexico is you can either, if you want to hunt public lands and there's a lot of public land out west, then you put in for a drawing and maybe you get drawn for, for the opportunity to hunt. But if you're hunting on private land, Basically, you just pay your fee, you buy yourself a tag and whatever the fee the landowner charges and you're good to go. But you can only hunt on that property. And it's like, it's not just, it's not just a convention, it's a law. If you go on somebody else's property, you can, you can be prosecuted and you got to have the right paperwork and all that. So bottom line, we were, we were hunting on some private property, which is what I thought was pretty cool. So we uh, flew to Denver. Um, rented a truck and drove down to Cimarron, New Mexico, which is very, very northern New Mexico. It's a high desert, about 6,500 feet elevation. And I'm telling you all these details because they'll come into play you know, in, my, in the 10 things that I learned. And we um, hunted for four days there. So um, I'm not going to make you wait to the end. I'm just going to go ahead and tell you, we saw a lot of elk, but neither one of us got an elk. Um, and the they were just too far away. We saw 50 elk at a time, literally. We counted like 45, 50s, best you could tell. Horns, horns and stuff sticking up everywhere. A lot of bulls, a lot of cows. And they were like way, way, way too far to shoot. And they were not on our property anyway. Um, so that's kind of the way it goes. So what I try to do whenever I have a situation that looks like it might be a failure or a disappointment, I try to to, to take something positive away from it. So I started asking myself as I was in the freezing 16 degree weather in the, in the mornings, um, what have I learned from this experience? Cause I ain't learning, I'm not learning how to get an elk. So I, I came up with 10 things. I was making notes on my phone. I came up with 10 things that I learned on this trip. So uh, without any further ado, we're gonna talk about those things right now. But actually there is gonna be a little bit further ado. So I just wanna give you a quick rundown of the gear that I took with me, the hunting gear at least. So, um, cause that's gonna come into play too. So first of all, I use my uh, Savage 110 Tactical 308 bolt action with a Nikon M308 scope on it. I had the uh, AccuTac uh, BR4 G2, I think that's it, um, by bipod here and a um, Blue Force gear Vickers Tactical Sling. Uh, the ammunition that I used, Oh, I had the 10 round Magpul AICS mags. And the ammunition I used was the Hornady 308. Here's, here's the, the tag on it. 308 ELD, which I think stands for um, extra low um, drag. I think that's what it stands for. 168 grain. And just to give you an idea of what it looks like, there's one of the bullets. It's got a little, uh, there's supposed to be some kind of um, thermal management tip on it. I don't know. So there's that. I also took, and this is something you really need to take with you as well. I took a um, my Nikon Monarch 
uh, range finder because you're talking, it's, it's important to know what your range is when you're shooting over two, three, four hundred yards. And, and again, this stuff's gonna come up, I'm not just showing you this for, this is gonna come up in the lessons. I just wanna give you kind of a background. And I took my Barska, um, one of these are 10 by, 10 by something. What are they? They're 10 by 42 binoculars. So, and they're decent binoculars. But, so anyway, having said all that, now let's talk about the lessons. So, the first lesson I learned, uh, and by the way, I had this in my uh, HQ issue travel case. I did a video on that. I'm not gonna try to, I got everything sitting on top of it now, so I'm not gonna hold it up. But um, that's what I've had everything packed in. Guns, knives, everything that, that, that was gonna be, uh, anything related to guns, there's, there's rules about flying. You have to, that's not what this video is about, but uh, so I had all that in there. So lesson one, we'll start at the airport. Uh, weigh your luggage carefully and leave yourself a little, a little, a little, um, I guess, wiggle room. So most airlines, um, any, any check-in baggage, they, they, I guess they limit it to 50 pounds. Anything over 50 pounds, you got to pay like a $50 extra charge. At least you do on Southwest. I'm pretty sure you do on Delta and most other airlines. So we got to the airport. And it's, this is like two days before Thanksgiving, so it's a really, really crazy. The Atlanta airport's under construction. It was just a mess. So we got there. I'm lugging all this stuff in. And my firearms case is about three pounds overweight. Now, bear in mind, I had already tipped the agent there 10 bucks because I knew it was going to be a little bit overweight. And I'm thinking, okay, maybe she'll let it slide. Because I've before, I've had people let it slide. But she wasn't letting it slide. She was nice, but she, 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 I guess maybe she couldn't, couldn't let it slide. So she's like, okay, can you take something out of there and put it in another bag? And my brain's thinking, it's still going to be on the same plane. What difference does it make, right? It's the same amount of weight going on the plane, but rules are rules, right? So, however, my other bag was also over. My, my regular bag it was like 52 pounds because I had a bunch of winter. You know, it's going to be cold out there, right? <laughs> anyway. We're playing like musical musical suitcases and luggage at the uh, airport check-in. People lined up behind us looking at us like we're a bunch of doofuses. My buddy had some room in his, and so we were able to get it. I was able to get my bags down, the point is. So anyway, uh, last part of that lesson is, however, we bought a, a few things, and I had the same or worse problem on the way back because his bags didn't have any room in them either because we bought some things uh, for during the hunt. So anyway... I wound up paying a $50, $50 surcharge just the heck with it on the way back. But so bottom line, if you can leave yourself some slack in your luggage, make sure it's under 50 pounds and 45 is real good. That gives you five pounds of leeway. So lesson number one, and I know if you're a frequent traveler, that's probably not a lesson to you, but I'm not. And it was, so that's number one. Number two, um, we were 6,500 feet. We were not in the mountains, but it was kind of a rolling meadow. It was really, really, it, there was no trees as far as you could see, literally, maybe a few little scrub trees. Uh, it was like high desert, but 6,500 feet, and I'm, I'm used to living at like five or 600 feet. Man, I was out of shape. I, I thought I was in good shape. I've been lifting and working out, man. I was beat, like literally out of breath, constantly even climbing up a little hill with a, with a lightweight backpack on. Um, fitness, man, make sure you got some good fitness. If you're planning on going, if you're unless you're used to living in high elevation, if you're planning on going to a, a you know over a mile high elevation, there's not as much oxygen up there. So make sure you, you, you have a good fitness regime and, and get yourself in shape long before you, before you go if you're planning a trip like that. Um, and it was funny because the, the farmer that, whose land we were on, he said he'd made, recently made a trip to Florida. He said, the air was so thick, thick down there, you could chew it. I said, man, I'm going to remember that one. But um, the air at 6,500 feet is not as thick. So anyway, number two is check your, make sure you got your fitness in order because it is a, it's a big deal. Number three has nothing to do with hunting whatsoever, but I did learn that iPhones suck. I'm just going to say that. I am, I've, I've had this iPhone for a long time. Uh, every, most everybody else in my family but one has got a Galaxy or Samsung phone. Uh, I, my friend had a Galaxy Note, Samsung Galaxy Note. I've got this iPhone 11. This was a new one like a year ago. This was a Mac Daddy phone. We both have Verizon. Um, he's talking on the phone. He's got an internet signal. He's searching up stuff. Um, I can't. I can't get on. I'm done. Like I got zero signal most of the time out there. I think the antenna in here is just not as good. I don't know, but I just wasn't happy with the iPhone. I'll just say that. So that's a little, little, not, not a, maybe not a, a big lesson about hunting, but 
it really does make a difference apparently so that's three <laughs> and like i said this is just lessons i learned maybe they're not all of them may not apply to you lesson number four if you're going to be hunting elk or any creatures out west um you're going to be probably looking at some long distance shots i mean here in georgia and deer hunting you may you know 100 150 yards is probably a, an average even maybe even a long shot man out there nothing is 100 yards it's, you're looking at two three even 400 yard shots or longer so if you're going to spot the game first of all you need some really good binoculars like i said these barskas are 10 by 42s and they just weren't getting the job done my, my buddy had some some vortex um i don't know what they were he just bought them they were 500 dollars binoculars but they made a tremendous difference not only were they much brighter and clearer but the magnification really lets you see the animals like i said we saw 50 elk at a time and you can identify which ones were which and all that which ones had bigger bigger horns and all that from a long way off so it really does make a big difference but if you're going to do that the more powerful binoculars you have the more support you need because the more magnification you got the harder every little jiggle is magnified so um i've seen people hunting elk with tripods for their for their for their um, binoculars so anyway good binoculars are really important for long range um hunting and that's, that's a lesson i learned because mine weren't good enough moving right along to lesson number five I think um, something that could be really handy to have is some kind of shooting stick. And, you know, I had this bipod on here from AccuTac, and these are really good bipods, okay? No, I mean, there's nothing wrong with these bipods, but they're really designed for, for, for prone shooting or maybe shooting off a rest. And most of the time, we were sitting on a hillside, maybe behind a, a bush, or trying to at least blend in with the bush because the bushes were about this tall. Like I said, we're in the high desert. So... Um, the bipod really didn't do a whole lot of good. Um, so we actually went to Walmart um, about an hour and a half away <laughs> and to get some couple things. And I bought this shooting stick there. And this is an Allen shooting stick. I think I paid like, you know, 10, 15 bucks for it maybe. And it's only, um, let's see. So it's only up to about this high. So it's about four feet long maybe. But um, if you're sitting down kneeling, it gives you it gives you some stability to put your rifle here, so you don't have to. At least you you only have, you only have to worry about this way. You don't have to worry about this way. So a shooting sticks a really really good thing to have something like that. Even I think a crossed shooting stick would be even better, but they didn't have one of those. So, but that's a um, anything that's going to be if you got a long range shot and you got high magnification again on your scope because my scope here goes up to like 16 power, so it's pretty pretty high magnification. Then any little movement is going to translate into a lot of movement at that, at that distance. So uh, anything you can do to st stabilize that rifle is going to be a really good idea. Uh, number six, speaking of um, looking through the scope and getting, getting a good scope sight picture, a good steady sight picture, um, your eye relief is really important. So like when I set the scope up for eye relief, I'm like this. And um, I sighted it in on a bench at home with, with something like this, right? wearing something like this but at 16 degrees i had a couple more layers on so i probably had at least a half inch more more thickness even pressing down maybe a little more and i noticed my eye relief was off like um you know you don't see the whole picture if, you, if you're too far away you just see a little bit of it and you got a lot of gray around the edge so i really had to like get awkward and almost like squeeze my neck forward and push forward with it just to try to get a good sight picture so if you're going to hunt in colder weather than you're used to you might want to um sight your rifle in wearing what you're going to wear uh, if it's going to be thicker so i think that's that's a, 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 a that was a, another lesson i learned again this may be something that's maybe old hat to you if you're hunting in cold weather a lot but i i'm in georgia it don't get that cold here number seven uh sling so i got a really really nice sling on here okay this is i'm just gonna leave that up now this is a vickers tactical um Blue Force gear sling, really nice sling. It's great. It's great for an AR-15 or tactical situation. It wasn't so great for carrying this thing over my shoulder when I had a backpack on and a hunting rifle, you know, up style. It's more designed for carrying a rifle like this or actually like more like this, you know, when you're in a, a, like a tactical situation. For slinging over your shoulder, this one just kept sliding off. It didn't do a real good job for me. So I went up just having to hold it up there the whole time. It didn't want to stay at all. So I think a traditional hunting sling with a little bit wider here, maybe some kind of kind of grippy stuff on it, a little padding would probably have been a lot better for that. So um, that's just another lesson I learned. Tactical slings are not great really for hunting. That's number seven. Speaking of carrying a rifle and um, you know dealing with that, another thing I learned was, it's number eight, 
I have 10 round magazines here. And these are Magpul magazines and they're about that big. And again, when you're trying to sling that over your shoulder, that thing just kind of got in my way. So I think um, they make five round mags for this. So I'd have been better off with a five round mag. So uh, longer mags kind of get in your way sometimes when you're hunting. Um, at least they did for me. So that's number seven, I'm, I'm number eight. We're almost there, so hang around. The next one has nothing to do with hunting, but uh, it could definitely, not knowing this lesson could screw up your entire hunting trip, I promise you. So, we, like I said, we flew to Denver and rented a four-wheel drive pickup truck because we because this is, the roads are rough down there. We're kind of out on cow pastures, basically, um, private private farm roads, and they're pretty rough and, rough and rutted for sure, and if it rained, they could get really, really messy. So, we got a four-wheel drive truck. Long story short, we were headed back one day, um, and it, the truck had tire sensors on it because it's a new Dodge truck, and one of the one of the back tires was was really really low. And luckily, we were almost to the farmer's um, compound where he's got his, his tractors and, and barns and stuff. And it was it was down down down. By the time we pulled into his to his gate, we were we were rolling on the rim. It was flat, and so we but but we we're no big deal. We're gonna change it and get on out there until we realized. There's no jack in this vehicle, no jack at all. Um, he had a floor jack, but you know, he has one of those things you gotta go through the bumper to lower your tire down, and that tool wasn't there either. So, I mean, good grief. We finally got the thing, you know, we, we were able to get a, 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 a tool out of one of the other trucks and make it work. We finally got the tire changed, but we, we were driving like hours, an hour or two on a, on a pretty much a two lane deserted road in the middle of nowhere just to get to the interstate. And if it had broke down, if we'd had a flat in the middle of there, we'd have been just completely out of luck. Maybe didn't have a phone signal and certainly didn't have a jack or anything. So bottom line, um, I probably have never done this. Um, you may do this as a matter of course, but if you rent vehicles, check and make sure it's got a jack and the proper tools to change the tire in it. So anyway, <laughs> nothing to do with hunting, but it could have ruined the hunting trip. It didn't, it didn't help us because it, it delayed us a couple hours anyway. But anyway, so that's number nine. Number 10. Is a lesson that I should have learned and I didn't. I should have already learned and I didn't. So this is Loctite 242. This is your friend. I did Loctite. I Loctited my scope, the base, all this, right? So I made sure that was Loctited um, when, I, when I mounted the scope and got it all sighted in. What I didn't check was what the factory stuff was. And about the second day, I noticed my scope had a little wobble in it. And as it turns up, it was where the screws to the base were not tight. And so it was barely wobbling. I'm thinking, okay, well, if I see an elk, you know, I, maybe it won't be off too bad. So anyway, I got home, I took it off and three of the screws in that thing were just, they weren't even hand tight. So now they're locked tight and they're tight. So even though it's from the factory lesson, check it, make sure, take the screws out and make sure they're locked tight. Anything that needs to be secured on there, make sure it's locked tight. Um, don't trust the factory because anyway, so that's 10 lessons and I'm about to stop. First one, we got one more bonus because you know I got to have a bonus lesson, right? And that is if you're going to go out elk hunting, you're going to go long range hunting of anything, know um, how much the, the, the bullet that you're shooting and the rifle you're shooting how much it's going to drop at different yardages. And this, this Hornady has actually got it on there. Most hunting ammo does. So if you zero it at 200 yards, uh, this particular one, you're going to be up 1.7 inches high at 100 yards. At 300 yards, you'll be 7.3 7 .3 inches um, low. And at 400 yards, you'll be 21 inches low. So you got to hold it up that much. And at 500 yards, it's 42 inches low. Now my scope has got a BDC compensator on it. And this scope is set up for 308, so it should be pretty close. It's got little little marks on it inside the scope to, to, to allow you to adjust for that. But it's important to know that because um, it's not all the same. You know, I, sh I shot some different ammo when I sighted this thing in, some 150 grain ammo, and at 100 yards, um, I had this one sighted in to shoot an uh, inch and a half high with this ammo, put some other ammo in it, and it shot like seven inches low at 100 yards. So it's just, you really got to know the ammo and, and, and the, um, the trajectory that you're going to take with you if you're going to take long range shots. It's real important because you don't want to spend all this money and go out there, spend all this time and, and, and you know, kick up some dust underneath them because you, because you messed up. So anyway, that's it. Uh, that's probably rambled way too much telling you these 10 lessons, but I did want to go ahead and, um, try to share something with you because I, uh, I couldn't share a picture of a big old elk, <laughs> but 
like I said, I try to take I try to take something positive away from every experience, and uh, these are good lessons to learn. So if I, if I get the opportunity to go back again, uh, these are these are ten mistakes, um, ten errors that I won't screw up on. So anyway, hopefully this has been helpful to you if you ever get the chance to go elk hunting or, or any kind of long range hunting. It, it really was a blessing to me to get to go because um you know this guy paid a pretty good bit of money f to that landowner for us to go and um so we still it still cost us a little bit we had to buy airfare and had to rent a truck and all that but it, it wasn't nearly as much as it would have been uh, if we had to pay for the whole hunt so i was very fortunate for that and um there you go that is my 10, 10 things I learned on an elk hunt. Hopefully, that'll help you. I really appreciate you watching Survival on Purpose. Remember, my name's Brian. Survival's not an accident, so be prepared. I'll see you next time.